velocity as a derivative in the kinematics sequence for calculus-based physics. I had covered in a prior lesson on kinematic speed and velocity about how velocity is um, how we quantify the rate of change at which the position happens, all right? So we're including a factor of time when we consider distance. And we can look at just average velocity, which is the displacement divided by the elapsed time. Average velocity happens over a longer time period. Instantaneous velocity is at a single point in time. And when I introduced this in the prior video, I had given this summary slide where we focus more on average velocity and average speed as opposed to instantaneous velocity and instantaneous speed. So average velocity and average speed, we need to think about a distance over a period of time. Instantaneous velocity, however, we're going to pull in our tool of calculus in order to look at that. So when I look at that velocity at a particular instant, what I'm doing is I'm taking the limit of the differential of the position function, okay? So the function will be uh, represented with time as an input variable, and we'll take the differential with respect to time of that position function. And so uh, we need to know calculus. I prepared a lecture that you can look at talking about simple derivatives. And what is known and covered in that lesson is that the derivative is represented by a tangent line to the position graph at a given value of time. That's what makes it instantaneous is as I look at an instant, a single given value of time. And if you imagine a graph that's curvy at each different point, the tangent line is going to have a different slope. So that's what we look at is the slope of that tangent line. I'm going to remind you that velocity is a vector, so instantaneous velocity is going to have vector properties. It may have um, a negative sign or a positive sign. It may have x and y and or z components, and you need to take that into account when you work with that. I prepared a couple of examples for us to look at. The first is looking at a graph and focusing on the tangent line feature of the velocity. Uh, given the position versus time graph here, here's position versus time, and you can see that this object is doing different things, uh, moving away from its initial and then toward, towards the origin and then away from the origin, um, and it turns around, turns around, and so it has some interesting motion. Um, and it asks about what is the velocity at, at different what values at different times. Identify the time or times at which the instantaneous velocity has the greatest positive value. So what we want here is the um, greatest positive slope. So we're going to say the m, the slope of the line is positive and it's the largest slope, largest slope. So when I look along here, I'll only be looking at this region here. Let's see. Yeah, the positive, if I look at a tangent line, the tangent line will have a positive slope in this region. Um, it turns negative here, it's negative there, and then from G all the way up to, I would say, L over here, it'll have a positive slope in those regions as well. Okay, so I've isolated it down to where is the slope positive, so from C to G, E, C to E, and G to L. And in those regions, we're going to ask, where is the slope the largest? So where is that tangent line having the largest slope? So I would say D is a good um, not candidate there. Uh, when I look at H as opposed to I, those aren't as steep as D. Uh, J is not as steep as D. D and K is not as steep as J. So I'm going to say that um, the instantaneous velocity based on the slope of the tangent line is going to be greatest at D. Okay, And that's as easy as that can be. We're just looking at that slope of the tangent line. At which times is the velocity zero? 
Well, when I look along here, it's not going to be the times where the slope is negative. We're going to have a negative slope in this region, a positive slope here, negative slope here, positive slope here. What we're going to notice is that there's going to be points where it changes from negative to positive or positive to negative, and those are the min or max. And if you know anything about derivatives, it's very convenient for us to take a derivative and set it equal to zero in order to find those min or max points on a graph. So we're going to notice at point C the slope of the tangent line is zero, point E the slope of the tangent line is zero, and I would say over here at L too that's going to be zero. So C, E, and L. Sorry my E and L look the same. Okay, so that's where the velocity is zero. And I've already pointed out at what times is the velocity negative. So these are going to be intervals. I'm going to have the interval from A to C. And then I'm going to have the interval from E to G. Those two intervals are when the tangent line has a negative slope. Okay. Uh, the next example I pulled up for us deals explicitly with the derivative of a function dependent upon time. So let's look at this. And this is a very good example of how to use derivatives in order to calculate the instantaneous velocity and it exemplifies the distance, the difference between instantaneous velocity, instantaneous speed, and this average velocity which we had to work harder to get at. The last example I have for you is another graph, a distance from velocity graph, and what this problem is highlighting. And for those of you who haven't seen integrals in calculus yet, when I look at velocity as a differential d by dt of the position function, let me write that out here, uh, what we can do is we can reverse this. We can say, well, if I take an inter if I move the d by the dt on each side, um, so v of t dt equals d of x, all right? And I do an integral on both sides. This side just becomes x of t, and I get an integral on this side, v of t dt. So if I take an explicit integral of the velocity function, that would give me the position function in theory, okay? We're not gonna do this for this problem. What I want to highlight is that um, when what an integral represents on a graph is the area under the curve. So area under the curve. So if I'm given a velocity graph, under the curve is going to be the distance traveled, the displacement of an object, okay? And so we're not going to use integrals in order to calculate this, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a nice velocity graph here. And you may already see already that this, um, it's easy to calculate the area under the curve on this graph. So if it says, how far has this object traveled after two seconds? Well, I'm going to look and find two seconds. And everything from zero to two seconds under that curve represents the distance traveled by this object in those two seconds. And when I look at it, I can find the area of a rectangle, right? Um, area equals length times width. Uh, and you can see that maybe there's a height here instead. So the area is going to be two seconds times four meters per second. When I multiply those together, you can see the units work out. And this will be eight meters. It traveled eight meters in those two seconds. It says, what is the av object's average velocity in those two seconds. If I want to find the average velocity, v average, v bar, however you want to write that out, um, I'm going to take the dis distance or displacement and divide by the time. Well, I know how far it's traveled, eight meters, and it traveled it in two seconds, so that's four meters per second. Pretty straightforward. I don't need to know this fancy out the fancy calculus involving integrals in order to find an area under a curve. 
Uh, just to confirm this, it says, what is the object's total displacement after four seconds? So after four seconds, I'm going to have to add in um, the extra distance traveled um, here. I'm denoting it in the purple here. So we're going to have the original eight plus this extra what's over here, right? Here's the first part. Here's the second part. So the area under that curve is going to be eight plus... Well, you can do, um, let's do uh, one half, uh, the area of a triangle, one half base times height. Uh, the base is two and the height is four. So one half, two times four. So I get eight plus four, which is 12 meters. It travels four meters total. I'm sorry, it travels 12 meters total in that four seconds. What is the object's average velocity after four seconds. So if we're doing average velocity, we're going to do the same thing we did up here, displacement over time. We're going to have 12 meters and it travels that in four seconds. So the average velocity over that whole period is three meters per second. Pretty straightforward.